Just for quality assurance. Yeah. Love the backgrounds. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> we figured we'd uh, get something appropriate. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're recording in triplicate. <laughs> so we do. Um, so are we ready to start? Yeah. Any questions you have for us before we start? No. So is Marie, are you ready to start, you mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, she's ready. Okay, all right. Hey, survivors, and welcome to another fine episode of The Walking Dead Talk Through. I'm Brian. And I'm Mark. Mark? <laughs> and I'm Mark. <laughs> uh, and we are here uh, with a very special interview. Yeah, we hear you. Are you, uh, you all right? You having audio issues there? He was having some inter internet issues, I think, so maybe... I don't know. I don't know if it's Zoom or what, but um, okay. So anyway, we are here uh, with a very special interview. We have uh, Lindsley Register, who is formerly of The Walking Dead up until recently, and she's got a new film uh, that uh, she wants to talk about. So um, both Mark and I have uh, had a chance to see it in the last couple of days. So welcome, Lindsley. Uh, you know, How are you doing? I'm doing really well. This is like, it's such a weird time. So it feels like such a loaded question right now when you ask somebody how they're doing, you know, because it's like, yeah, it's like good and bad and weird and unusual. And I can't wait for this to be over. But I just found out we're looking at three more months of this in California. Yeah. I heard. So I'm just like trying uh. to not resist, it, you know, just like go with it. It's just a lot, though. But you've been keeping yourself busy, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I, I'm curious, like, what the, the time's been. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, like, what, like, how have you spent the time, you know, so obviously you can't, like, you know, can't work on any uh, <laughs> movies or anything like that. Are you um, just kind of working on your craft from home or just doing other stuff or? What? Yeah, some of that. Um, I have been doing like a lot of reading. Um, oh, oh, there we are. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading, um, playing the piano, watching, I mean, binge watching tons of stuff on Netflix. Like a lot of actors are doing meet and greet, um, like Zoom sessions with casting directors right now, a little bit of writing. Like I tried my hand at painting, like you name it. And I feel like I've done it during quarantine <laughs> so awesome very cool plus your promotion. all right uh well <laughs> yes called scorn so um why don't you tell the listeners about uh scorn like i'm curious how you like got into this project because you're also listed as a producer and a an executive producer so so you, you're you're in three different roles i guess uh actor producer and executive producer <laughs> so is that something you've done in the past or is this a new kind of thing for you oh you she is that. frozen i readmitted her oh okay There she is. Okay, you're muted. I'll, I'll unmute you. Okay, there. Oh, great. Okay. I, we're doing the phone because my computer is just is falling apart, poor girl. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the phone will work. So Hopefully anyway, what, what, what I was, uh, what I was getting at before um, the, the sound cut out and you cut out um is that you're like in this new uh movie 
scorn you are like in like three different roles from what i saw as actor you know as a lead as producer and executive producer so um why don't you tell us a little bit about like how you got involved with this project and you know the number of hats that you wore curious about that yeah it, it was a lot of hats um, and it was my first time ever attempting to take on that much at once. Um, you know, I was, it was four years ago. So I love to say like, I was young and naive at the time. I was so much younger than now. Um, oh, it's, and, it was four, done four years ago. Didn't realize that. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty yeah. Cool. It's okay. been a long time coming. Um, but basically four years ago, I went to uh, one of the strongest writers I know, Jonathan Faircloth Kirk, who I had met in school, um, and a few other people that I just really wanted to create something with, and asked, basically asked Jonathan to write a crazy good role for me. Um, when you're an actor, you just, you don't get to do what you love to do. It, it's just so right. rare, you know, that you actually get an opportunity to act. And I just decided that I wasn't gonna wait for somebody to see my potential and cast me in a role which ended up happening you know when I um, mm -hmm. started working on six soon after and started working on Walking Dead right after we finished um, principal photography but I asked them to give me an opportunity to act and brought some resources to the project um, as much as I can muster so that's that's how it all began really it was just a group of friends great and like what what um what's the difference between being a producer on the film versus being an, an executive producer because i i think most laymen wouldn't get the difference yeah like executive producer what most of my um what i was doing there was bringing resources so mm. pouring money into the film um having more creative control maybe then even a producer would have things like that, making story edits, making um, notes on the, the final edit, things like that. As a producer, I was doing a lot of groundwork, um, you know, in, in contact with potential filming locations. I was uh, organizing our crew. I was doing like a lot of, you know, like you said, I was wearing a lot of different hats. So as a producer, I was just doing a lot of like groundwork. Um, and it's a lot, you know, but indie film, if you know anything about indie film, it's kind of the, that's kind of the game when you're on a tight budget and, you know, you want to be doing it. So. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Yeah. The, th the thing that I thought of while watching it yesterday is that, okay, go ahead, Mark. Oh, <laughs> uh, we're as, definitely having bandwidth problems tonight. Yeah. There's a lag. Though. The, uh, yeah. as being uh, an executive producer, what input did you have within the actual project itself? I know you were wearing the hats, but what input that, you know, that you created or directly affected the movie itself? Um, so what it looked like was when Jonathan would have a first draft of the script, he would send it to me, uh, give input, give ideas, give notes, things like that. Um, when our, when we started to have, you know, our first edits, uh, additionally to being a part of that process, you know, larger parts of, um, story editing really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. And I noticed that the film was shot in Charlottesville, Virginia. Is that yeah. where you were based before or? I wasn't, I wasn't based in no. Charlottesville. I was living in Virginia at the time. I, I grew up in Virginia, uh, really close to the mm. Appalachian Trail. In fact, pretty much on the Appalachian Trail. Um, mm. And was studying in the area. And when we decided to make the film, we just found this incredible house in Charlottesville. It was pretty close to where a lot of us were based at the time, which was Lynchburg. Um, so mm -hmm. it's about an hour and a half away. And if you guys haven't been to Charlottesville, it's a really cool area. Like really yeah. um interesting artsy downtown scene and so it ended up being a great spot for us to make the movie mm. interesting uh, whatever i think of charlottesville i think of the waltons because <laughs> there was a lot of uh charlottesville was mentioned a lot in the waltons but i'm giving away my age 
Um, <laughs> we'll, we're going to, we'll circle back to scorn in a minute, but you know, we're a walking dead podcast, so we better get on the walking dead. So I, I am curious how you got the role as uh, Laura on the walking dead. Um, yeah. So basically how it works is like my agent will send me appointments. Um, I don't really go out and, or I don't go out and look for roles. I don't get to pick what I'm auditioning for largely. Um, so one day there's just an email in my inbox. It's like, Hey, you have a self tape request for the walking dead, which I mean, actors these days really don't go on many in-person auditions. Um, most of the time it's just me with my iPhone at home in front of my living room wall, filming myself act a scene that was sent to me and I send it away and you know 99% of the time you don't hear anything back you don't hear any critique you don't hear any um notes and so this one in particular so you get very used to just sending off tapes all the time like every week I'm just sending off an acting scene and I don't I do not get attached and I don't think about them otherwise your hopes are just shattered all the time um, are you still and- sending off like physical copies or is it like are you like sending them like unlisted YouTubes uh, or something like that? Or normally no. like we transfers, like they're very oh, okay. picky about how you send them. Okay. Yeah. Cause it I can't be anything that, yeah. that could ever be accessed. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Normally gotcha. we transfers. So yeah, it was just me. I think I was visiting my parents at the time. I shot it in their office. I sent it off and was like, Oh, that's cool. Auditioning for the walking dead. That'd be fun. Um, I didn't really expect to hear anything back, you know? Did you know much about the character that you were playing? No, um, no. not much at all. They were, I auditioned with fake sides. Um, so it was like a fake made up scene, nothing that ever made it into the show. And I just got like a sense of, oh, fake name too. I just got like a sense of what kind of character they were looking for. She was mm-hmm. kind of like this tough, um, but like she was kind of playful in the sides. That's how it was pitched mm-hmm. to me anyways. Like, she does bad things, but she enjoys it. Um, and I thought that was, like, super, like she, like, kills this guy in, in my sides that I auditioned with. She, like, kills this guy. And then she's like, oh, damn it. He was cute. Like, like you know. Uh, <laughs> so it was just kind of fun. Uh, that's cool. What did you say your, your favorite scene uh, playing was on The Walking Dead in your four seasons? Ooh. Um, that's really good. Well, I feel like it probably would be the scene that didn't make it in when me and uh, Eugene made love. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were hilarious to me. So, so it is true that you and Eugene uh, were going to get a little freaky freaky and we didn't get Did to it. see it. Why Not didn't they on. show that? I think it just would have been, you know, like too much for you guys. Your minds just would have like exploded. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was too hot. It was like too sexy for television. So, so with that, with that missing scene with uh, you and Josh, uh, did Josh make you laugh during the scene, or did you make Josh laugh at some point while doing that scene? Josh is so serious on set. He's you know he's really? like very serious actor. Really? Um, yeah, I love it. He he he's a real he's a real actor. That one. And so he took it very seriously the whole time. You know, I'm like just trying to hold it together. Yeah, I'm super nervous. I've never filmed yeah. anything like that. Um, so it was a little nerve wracking. And, you know, they're like, hey, you want a grilled cheese, Lindsley? And I'm like, uh, no, I don't want a grilled cheese. I'm, you know, in my underwear on like national television <laughs> right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So no, um, but I think, I think he made me laugh more than that I made him laugh in that one. Cool. What what season was that going to be in? Is that season eight or seven? Eight. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm very curious about it now. <laughs> <laughs> I know all this stuff that you guys will just like never see that's just like goes off into the oblivion like it never happened. So aside from that scene, uh, what like what was your favorite scene that we did get to see? I think um, maybe maybe the scene when I got to shoot Dwight, I really felt it was like it was nice to get to like have some action for once, you know, to yeah. really get a piece of it. 
Um, so that was really fun for me. It felt like, it felt like a big moment for my character, um, which I kind of thought it was this moment where there's like, oh, well, there's no turning back now. I mean, she's bad. Like she shot, you know, the double agent. So, um, which ended up not happening, which really surprised me. But I, I that scene, you know, was meaty for me. Mm. Hmm. That, was a, that was a good scene, actually. Yeah. Where's that coming from? <laughs> Outside our window. I think there's a motorcycle outside. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Almost at it, first it sounded like a flushing toilet, and then it sounded like an airplane. But... Oh, then I mentioned I'm like, you know, kind of like multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good old Zoom calls. Um, so uh, what about the, uh, you had the, what I used to call uh, during the, the episodes the barcode tattoo obviously it wasn't a barcode but and and you had the nose piercing and all that so like how much of that was did you have any input on what you look like in the show or did you used to wear your hair back really tight as well mm-hmm. yeah i didn't i don't have too much input on what mm-hmm. laura's looks normally are um, when I first got cast, like you go to the hair and makeup trailer, like before you ever start filming and they kind of mess around with your look and then take some pictures and get it all approved by Scott Gimble, who was our showrunner at the time. Right. Um, right. and so they were like putting these like black, like hair extension pieces in there and, um, you know, experimenting with my hair. They loved the nose ring. They were like, keep that. Um, they had like, some oh, so you had the nose ring already. Yep. She's had yeah, the was, nose ring. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, we just decided that she, Laura is a soldier by, I mean, that's her occupation now. She follows orders. So it made sense that her hair's pulled back tight. Like she's kind of like a no nonsense, like we're here to get the job done kind of gal. So hair back tight. Um, and then the neck tattoo, you know, it just, it came in this, um, it came in this collection of uh, what I was told were tribal tattoos. And it was just kind of slapped on my neck and we were like, looks good. <laughs> you know, that worked. It, it actually did they have pointed to your character. Did they have I, to apply that each time in makeup or was it yeah. like a temporary or something? Okay. Yeah. There would be a couple that. of times when they'd be like, do you think you could like sleep tonight and come back with it on tomorrow? I don't always try and I always fail. And then it took more time and then make a trailer to like, take it the rest off yeah. and like put a new one on so and also like you don't want me walking around like Peachtree City Georgia with this like very recognizable tattoo right show, so that I have to hide it so we always took it off and put it on <laughs> wear scarves yep that works mm-hmm. yeah. yeah in like a hundred degree weather yeah I'm just, it's for fashion it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm from Hollywood <laughs> yeah um did you get any kind of backstory on Laura uh, as far as you know where she came from or did you like work out a backstory for her yeah um Scott and I chatted a little bit when we first met that day that I was in the hair makeup trailer and the only thing that I really remember him telling me about my character was she likes to have fun which I don't really know that we ever got to see see much of I mean maybe in little glimpses but we never really got to see Laura have too much fun which I I hoped to bring when I first started in season seven and you know it was just kind of like directed away from that was pulled away from that and so she kind of evolved on her own I I did of course like as an actor you know I always have an extensive backstory for my characters so I just kind of made some decisions about where I thought she came from um and what had happened to her prior to the outbreak so what what was that backstory that you came up with? I imagine that Laura was a bartender, um, that she was kind of okay. used to like giving it to people. Um, you know, as a female bartender, you have to be like really thick skinned. You're like telling, you know, I, I'm almost, yeah, I have to watch my language. Um, but Laura wouldn't. And I, so I just got the impression that she was kind of like a take no, take no shit kind of gal. Um, she could hold, hold her own. 
And, you know, I wrote about some of her relationships, um, maybe that she was a bit more vulnerable and I wanted her to be a real person, you know, even if we don't see all of that end up on the right. screen, I think it still matters. Yeah. I got the impression she was more like a bouncer at a bar. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because actually the first scene that we uh, see her in in uh, season seven, episode three, you know, which uh, is was the cell, but everyone knows it for the Easy Street song. <laughs> yeah, that curse um, song. Yeah, that you were you were doing like a drinking game with Dwight in that in that first scene. So yeah, yeah. So I guess so that makes sense. When we were shooting that, I was shaking in my boots that was my first dance set oh wow so working with um i'm, I'm kind of some of these questions we've got written and some of these questions i'm coming off the top of my head but and this yeah. is one off the top of my head so um in, in the four uh seasons you got to work with quite a few different actors obviously you got to work with jeffrey dean morgan quite a bit austin emilio when he was on walking dead uh Josh McDermott, you know, et cetera. And, and then later, you know, some of the Alexandrians. Um, who who did you enjoy uh, working with, especially, like, not to pick favorites, but if you, if you have to single out one actor that you enjoyed working with on The Walking Dead, uh, who would it be? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, I really, you don't have to leave, I mean, limit okay. it to one. Can, okay, then I'll say power that. Power <laughs> okay. Um, so Kari Payton is just like a ball of fun. Okay. Yeah. What you see like in the BTS is what you get. He's just like a party animal and kind and so sweet. Elizabeth Ludlow, who played Arat, like another um, Negan um, right. soldier, she and I became really good friends and we still hang out like oh. all the time here in LA. But if I could say one more, um, Austin Emilio was... Anytime he was on set, I was comfortable. He's a, just like a nice guy. He's an easygoing, like Texan who smokes a lot and gives a lot in his scenes. And if I could work with him again, that would be a dream. That's cool. Great. Yeah. That's cool. Now, speaking of Austin Emilio, you were the one that kind of ratted out Dwight. So, <laughs> um, were you surprised that that uh, Laura did that, or because like, I know I know as a as a viewer, we were uh, at least I was kind of like not sure if she was going to rat him out or if she was going to like take his side with Negan, mm -hmm. but but obviously um, she ratted uh, Dwight out. So um, I mean, at, but then you're also you were also like one of the first to surrender at the um i don't i don't know what else to call it but the the uh oh, wow. glass windows on the tree uh field uh -huh. <laughs> yeah so um going through that like i mean that that uh that war was pretty brutal like especially for uh viewers it was kind of like a long enduring thing but like what you're what do you think was behind your character kind of uh, changing and, and, you know, surrendering, I guess. And then we have a follow-up question from, from uh, someone else. So. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, it didn't surprise me when she read it out, Dwight, because the way I saw Lara was that she just, she survived. She got this far by picking the leader and following orders. Like she really was a soldier. Um, so it didn't surprise me when she stuck to her guns and was loyal to Negan in the face of Dwight. Mm -hmm. But when that happened, I was like, oh shit, I'm, I'm done on the show. You know, as soon as Rick, uh, like, you know, takes care of business, I'm done. I'm gone. So I was like, oh, well, I wonder how my death's going to look. Um, it was surprising to me the way things played out, you know, with some of us going to live there. Um, so again, I guess I'd say I wasn't surprised that she surrendered and was willing to like work under new management, essentially. I don't think that she was particularly loyal to Negan from an emotional uh, mm -hmm. place, more from like a I need to survive kind right. of place. And now Rick's the new Rick's the new leader. And so I get in line and I just like kind of look out for me. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, uh, we got a question here from um, uh, actually a friend of ours, Jason from the Walking Dead cast. You may even know him from um, yes! Walker Stalker Time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So so he asked this question. He said, I'd like to know if she worked out how her character went from being a loyal and vicious member of the Saviors to being on the community council at Alexandria after the time jump and what that transformation over the years looked like. You know, it's, it, I, okay, forgive me if you guys have already heard this or if you've already heard this, Jason, but like during, during some of those scenes when I was like a council member in Alexandria, like I think there was a few times where Ross Marquand would like look over at me and be like, how the, did you get here? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? And I was like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. I guess, I guess she must have shown something to prove herself a valuable ally. And, and, and maybe that's even like double agent is the wrong word, but like maybe she brought some sort of savior tactics to, you know, Michonne's world. And, and that was valuable enough to trust her. Um, some insights as to how the saviors got to be as powerful as they did. That makes, let, makes me believe you know, that she could have gotten there. That, and also it's like, they have all these ex um, saviors, a part of their community now. Maybe it was some sort of to keep the peace by having me like as a representative of them on the council. These are things that I kind of tossed around in my head. Mm -hmm. hmm. Cool. Now, I guess since you, you had almost equal time between them, what was it? Yeah. How would you compare the difference in playing a savior versus playing an Alexandria? It's so much more fun to play the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's like the motorcycle and like the leather gloves and like chasing people down and being just like <laughs> evil and like fans tweeting you like I hate you I hate you. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I saw that at Walker Stalker, the last two in Georgia I saw you at. Yeah. <laughs> they would say that. I don't like it. I was like, I, it's <laughs> and not that, her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, who would you rather play, like Joker or like Captain America? Like, which one is more interesting, you know? So I, yeah. I think it's a bit more fun to play the bad guy. I never yeah. get to be bad guys. I'm too smiley. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of a bad guy in scorn i guess but... that's well, true yeah partially. yeah it, uh, <laughs> it goes three ways at that point you have right. realize within that movie Amen, yeah. yeah yeah so and, uh, and uh the the last question i've got with that is that unfortunately you died at the hands of beta uh when beta kind of did his like uh, personal invasion of alexandria yeah. And I saw you were online kind of like um, doing your, you know, I don't know if it was on Instagram or what it was, but um, you kind of did a video saying goodbye. And I know you got pretty uh, emotional about it. Um, so it's all behind you now. So like what I mean, I guess first, first I could, I'll ask about the, the death scene itself. Um, cause honestly, I'll, I'll just say like, at first I didn't realize it's like, did she just die there? <laughs> Both were like that. that happened. Yeah. We thought she just got knocked down. Yeah. And then we realized it's like, oh shit, she got, she died. There. <laughs> oh, darn. Yeah. I think, I think it was on talking dead that I finally like, wait a mm -hmm. minute, she did die. Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, what, what was that scene like? And, and, you know, you, you obviously had to say goodbye to all your, you know, cast members and that. Um, we've heard about the dinners. I don't know if that was still a thing. Um, but anyway, just talk a little bit about your, your like final days on set. It was like, it was really hard because, mm. you know, I'm feeling like super emotional about it being like, I kind of always refer to like my time on Walking Dead as like going to camp. Because sometimes that's what it felt like, like going to summer camp, like you're outside, you're hot, you're uncomfortable, you're getting bit by bugs, but you're like hanging out with your friends and you're like feeling so alive. So it's like, it's kind of like, I'm at my last day of camp, but like, I really need to like focus on this scene right now. And I keep having to like put out of my mind, that this is like 
the last time that I'm ever going to be here. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It's like making my nose burn right now. Just like thinking about it because it was just such a special time in my life, you know? Um, and filming that scene was so fun. So fun. Like they put this like belt around my waist and then one around my chest so that he could like actually pick up my like horizontal limp body. Um, and Angela Kang, when they reached out and when they said that I was going to die, they were like, trust us it'll be we'll make it a good one we promise and i was i was really happy with what they wrote for me i thought it was like yeah really gory and violent and everybody who dies on walking dead wants a violent death and yeah it a, a lot of people were like asking me like tweeting like are wait what are you, you died that killed you like what and I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> beta was uh, force of nature so i guess yeah he's a big dude i don't think i stand a chance when he's like throwing my head into a steel bar you know so Uh, but it was so fun like choreographing that and like doing some of my own stunts and that was like super fun and like ryan like asked us to do even more choreography to make it more of a fight scene which like Oh my God, like, I just, as an actor, you're really appreciative to anyone who wants to give you more, you know? So Mm -hmm. that was also really special. Now, when you were uh, filming The Walking Dead, did you, like, did you stay in Atlanta during that time? Or did you just, like, go back and forth between L.A. and Atlanta? I go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, You know, it's like March through November. My life belongs to The Walking Dead. Like, I don't know if I can come to your wedding. I don't know if I can come to your kid's birthday party. (laughs) Like, my life literally belongs to the show. And I never knew when I was going to go film. So it'd be like two, three days in advance. Hey, you're in this episode. Let's go. Get on a plane. And I'd go. And I actually would stay in Peachtree City. So Mm -hmm. it was like the middle of the woods. It was like really rural. And sometimes I would take the hour long Uber to get into Atlanta to like, you know, do things and see friends. But a lot of time I was like staying in Peachtree City and just like Hmm. getting drinks with cast after the, uh, after our days and hanging out. Oh, cool. We should get back to Scorn. Um, Mark, you had some questions there. Sure. Uh, So basically the three characters within the movie itself, there was a lot of tension within that at almost every scene, obviously. How did you maintain that throughout? And you said you were filming this, you did it four years ago, but did you do it over the course of four years or did you do it at one single time? We actually shot it over the course of nine days. And by days, I mean, we shot at night. So we, Mm -hmm. we slept during the day and we got up at night and we'd film all night, which is, an unheard of small amount of time to make a feature length film. Yeah. So it was, it was difficult, but we made it happen. And as far as keeping the tension alive, um, I think we were really careful to try and craft like ebb and flows of like dramas, you know, they need comedy, they need breath, they need, they need the dramatic dangerous moments. And then they also need breathing room. And so we tried to, we rehearsed it like a play before we started filming and really tried to um, capture those moments. Um, Oh, sorry guys, I was getting a FaceTime call, but you're there. Yeah, you're you're good. Yeah, Yeah, but we just rehearsed the shit out of it and you know, to make sure it was all there, everything that needed to be there. And you are a love of the Meisner technique. I I saw. How has it helped you with that while you were portraying the character? Meisner technique, um, for the listeners who maybe some of them don't know what Meisner is, um, it's just basically a technique that a lot, or or, or a practice that a lot of actors will use, and and some non-actors do it as well, in order to, like, break down barriers, um, to make you more vulnerable, to make you more... um, Ex- even to make your emotions more accessible and to tell, like work on telling the truth, honestly. So as an actor and particularly for Zoe, I think that Meisner technique helps me be in the moment and really be able to look my partner in the face and really take in what's going on with them to really notice when there's a change in them, 
to really notice when there's like a new moment when something maybe is underneath the surface of what they're saying, like the subtext of what they're saying. Um, yeah, I recommend that everybody like look into who Sanford Meisner is. And this is not a cult. This is not like Scientology. <laughs> not like what's the up. what's the elevator pitch for the Meisner technique? Oh God, I, I don't. It it sounds way too cultish. Like <laughs> that's why I should just like emphasize. It's like a practice that a lot of actors use, and it's yeah. Oh God, I'm just floundering, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so now um uh, we we should give uh, an idea for uh for our listeners and and people that are watching this on youtube um what tell a little bit about the about scorn without like giving out any like major plot details like yeah what, what uh what you play in the film and you know what the basic idea of the film is yeah, um, so our tagline is, Scorn is a story about the ugly things that beautiful people do to each other. And at the time we were making it, you know, we were all heading into what we hoped would be a career in Hollywood um, in various forms. I wanted to act. We had a writer, director. We had, you know, a lot of people involved that wanted to work in Hollywood. And we said it was a love letter to our future selves of, you know, what kind of things can happen when you prioritize fame or your desires in general above all else. So the main, the main, the story revolves around three main characters, Liam, Zoe, and Merrick. So Liam and Zoe are partners and Liam is starting to experience some relative success as an actor, which that's bringing some tension into his relationship with Zoe, who is not mm -hmm. uh, finding success as an actor. And then one evening after a drunken, uh, premiere party of Liam's movie, the director comes over and they have this very long drug fueled, what turns into like a caustic evening together where truth just starts spilling out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, Mark, you had, I think you had a couple other questions as well. Oh, I have a whole bunch, but I'm only going <laughs> to give you so many depending on what you were willing to, to answer. So th there was a bicycle in, one, in a couple of the scenes that Liam rides around. Now, that just reminded me of the same bicycle that Pee Wee Herman rode in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> what was the uh, premise behind having that within it? I know it? I know it was way of Liam's way of getting away from the conversation as mm. a distractant. But who came up with the idea of the prop? And was it in there for a goof or a gag or... What? That's actually, well, that's a really good observation that like Liam used it to sort of remove himself from, you know, what was going on. He doesn't, he doesn't want to be there for most of the evening, I think. Yeah. Um, and my sister said it kind of reminded her almost of like an F. Scott Fish, Fitzgerald, like a Gatsby type of move, yeah. which I also thought was a good observation because it too reminds me of, you know, something Gatsby would have done in his home. Our, it was our director's idea, Jonathan, who, uh, Jonathan Faircloth Kirk, who also wrote the script. He's a brilliant writer and we've worked together for a while. Um, we thought almost that we weren't going to be able to bring the bike into this guy's like beautiful home because like where is their room to and ride? Wood floors. Yeah, wood floors. <laughs> yeah. Got a nice house. Like where well, are you broke glasses too. <laughs> Those are breakaway. Oh, okay. So you didn't cut your feet or anything. That's a good thing. No. Oh, no. No. Those were fun, though. Those were fun to throw. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, my next question, uh, the Gibson. Now, was that a real Gibson that he was drinking? or And was there uh, – th did somebody just like Gibsons and they had to have that in the movie? Gibson Martini as opposed to Gibson Guitar. Yes. <laughs> I have Gibson Guitars, but I'm yeah. talking about the Martini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't think any of us actually, so it wasn't a real Gibson that he was drinking, though there were other times in the movie that I believe we were drinking real alcohol. Like, I think there's a moment where we all take a shot, and I think it was a real shot that we oh. were wow. of whiskey. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can do that kind of stuff on indie films, and you can get away oh, yeah. with it. <laughs> um, well, you guys are in charge, so you're allowed to do that, that kind of right. thing. Right. <laughs> um, but the Gibson, 
I believe, I believe that's a true story that Jonathan brought into the script of, you know, there's this um, investment banker who he's trying to swindle some clients. And so he has them drinking martinis and he's got an onion in his drink so he doesn't yeah. drink any booze. So he's just drinking water. Um, and it's, it's kind of the symbolism behind it has a lot to do with um, manipulation, with lying. And of course, we know that mixing up drinks comes back into into play later on in the movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, also, you had cocaine use in the movie. Obviously, that wasn't, but it really looked like you guys were snorting it up. Was there kind of like a side gag or how to like a camera move that you were able to do that? Because I, I don't want to see anybody snorting sugar or salt or anything like that. Right. <laughs> or baking yeah. powder. Yeah. It was, okay, we did a lot of research about, like, what are the greats? What are they doing in movies when they're snorting coke? Like, I, I think it was, like, there was something with, maybe it was one of the Godfather movies, but don't quote me on that, where somebody's snorting coke, and we were like, how are they pulling this off? And there are a lot of different ways that you can fake it, but what it came down to was we were going to have to actually – snort something up our noses Oops. so then the research becomes what is the safest thing to snort up your nose and that <laughs> happens to be milk powder so oh, okay milk powder we were trying this thing though where our production designer who she did an incredible job Heidi Sneed um, where we roll up the dollar bill and we coated the inside with like a thick layer of Vaseline and the idea was that like oh well when you go to snort it it'll Caught stick in. to the Vaseline and it won't go in your nose well it did not work and i did get <laughs> like it was the grossest thing i've ever experienced like i've never tried cocaine and i never will now because just like snorting something up your nose is incredibly painful and uncomfortable and i just there was like all this like milk in my head it was awful yeah <laughs> no hmm <laughs> now do you listen to any music to get into any sort of character just like you know did you do that for zoe did you do that for laura because honestly throughout the movie the movie had a lot of music within it and it was a very broad and interesting kind of because of the vinyl collection that liam had and that was also another distraction point from the conversation as well mm-hmm yeah i i do use a lot of music for like character development um and but this one in particular our director jonathan he i mean is a music fanatic and so he actually created a spotify playlist for me and for zoe okay. um and it really did come in handy with helping me like create a mood to create an environment i think there was like some bonnie tyler on there um uh, I did listen to a lot of the Velvet Underground for um, the movie. It just felt right. Cool. Great. Now, uh, the TV series Ember is in post-production. Is there a release time for that yet? There isn't. Um, but I'm really excited. We That one, I believe, we want to pitch. So I'm just an actor on that. I'm not helping produce. Okay. But we did... I think that they wanted to pitch it before um, seeing about releasing it. So I hopefully, hopefully I'll have something else to bring to you guys soon. I'll keep you updated for sure. And the nine realms, the fateful oath. Uh, it's a short movie that you completed. Uh, you play mother. Can you talk about this and what it's about? Yeah, that one's actually a really old project. Um, oh. It was a short I did a long time ago. I think it looks newer than it is on my IMDb. Um, and um, but it was like a period piece, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, yeah, I'd have to go. I'd really have to search to go find that project, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd ask because I was curious about it. I never, I, I read it and I looked into a few things and I was like, I should look for it. I can't find it. Yeah. Hard to find. But uh, you, you, in your bio, you, you talk about going back into the ground. You went into the groundlings. Yeah. Which class was that? Is that a most recent class or are you still in it? I I was until like quarantine happened and I didn't get to finish my advanced class. Um, so I've been studying improv at the Groundlings for about um, just like a little over a year and a half now. Okay. And it's been like the most fun part, like addition of my life. It's 
definitely helped free me up as an actor. It definitely helped me like not take myself too seriously, which I think actors absolutely cannot take themselves too seriously. Um, Do you see like a, a future in comedies? Or? I am dying to do a comedy. Um, I think you'd be good know, at it actually. Same here, yeah. I, oh. I would love to do a comedy. I'm actually like a big goofball at heart. And honestly, I just like want to be an actor that just like, does all kind of things that I, I want to be versatile, you know? And mm. so I'd, I'd love for my next project to be a comedy, actually. Cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, a good rom-com would definitely do you. Yeah. Good, yeah. I think. Because mm -hmm. everybody's got that taste of Laura. <laughs> hey, haircut. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, it's like, she. wow, she's, we like her now. <laughs> but I'm sure a lot of people liked you towards the end because they saw the response at Walker Stalkers when I've seen you there. Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. seems to enjoy your presence. And you uh, you always seem to dress so nice, too. When I when I saw you there, you had a nice dress and when I saw you in Atlanta. And I was, how tall is she? And I think you were wearing long heels when I saw you. Was I? Oh, my yeah. God. Wow. I felt so short. I was like, I was like oh wow. Wait, which one? Did, wait, we we must have met then at um, the Bash. Past, Sonoya yeah. Dead Bash was it? No, I was never at Sonoya Dead Bash. Uh, I was at uh, in Atlanta in October when we had it this past in 2019. I didn't really have much time because I did a panel with Tony Moore. Yes. So, oh yeah. And I was helping other people like Jason with his panels. Yeah, and I only ever made one Walker Stalker, and that was in Orlando. So, mm. um, the I, I always intended to go, and always something came up. Like 2019, my wife broke her ankle, so I couldn't go. <laughs> but uh, oh, so uh, we should tell listeners um, if they want to see Scorn, how would they do so? Um, so it's streaming right now on Amazon Prime. You can buy it for less than five bucks. Yep. And that's what I did, by the way. I bought it. Same here. <laughs> it is only in the US and the UK, unfortunately. But if it does well here over the next few weeks, we really are prioritizing. We want to bring it um, internationally. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So it's, it's just on Amazon that right now. Correct. At yeah. the moment, yeah, At we have moment. a few other platforms um, expressing interest in it. It's been doing really well, so it'd be great to bring it to a wider platform as well. That'd be great, yeah. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought, I thought the ending was um, rather surprising, um, yeah. and it kind of fit into the the title, I think, really well. Um, so, what what else do you have? Well. Obviously, with the COVID nineteen stuff, uh, things are kind of coming to a halt. But like, what what do you have coming up? What are you planning to work on? Anything else that uh, anything you, you want to plug wanna that you're plug? doing currently while you're in quarantine? Obviously, people are doing uh, cameo. I think it is. Yeah, and... yeah, I'm on cameo. Okay, so okay, yeah. people could check you out there and. Uh, mm -hmm have a one-on-one -on -one. are you doing online conventions because i know ross marquand and a few other actors are doing things and then there are other people are going to wizard world are you doing any of those where it's like a virtual meet and greet yeah you know i'm not doing i'm not doing any of the online conventions at the moment um i do so i like you said i do do some personal um videos through cameo and i i maybe not a lot of people know this but i do have some people that i privately coach for acting Oh. So I do some of that with people. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of them have been fans that have expressed interest in learning how to act. So I do some consultations um, and some video coaching for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But as far as future projects come up, uh, as far as they go, it's like, it's a weird time. You know, it's like mm. such a liability for any of us to be on set together. Yeah. I, am, I do have some meetings this week that I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear the fireworks? It's 8 p.m. Yeah. here and everybody's cheering. Awesome. Um, so I don't really know what the next project is going to be. I don't know if it'll be something I produce. I don't know if it's something that I'll be cast in. Um, just know that I am a busybody and I love my work. So it'll be something sooner rather than later. 
Well, that, that's great. Keep us keep in touch so we can uh, we can plug when you've got some new stuff coming up. Exactly, that would be great. Uh, so, if if fans want to get a hold of you, I know you're on Instagram because that's kind of how I found you. Um, but if uh, if fans want to get a hold of you, how would they how would they do that? Yeah, the best way I'm I'm on a lot of the platforms. So you can find me on Instagram at Lindsley Register. I'm on Twitter at Lindsley Reggie, and I do some YouTube here and there. Whenever I feel like sharing things from my life, I'll post on YouTube. Um, and Facebook, if you're still on Facebook, I'm also there too. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, is there anything else you want to say or, you know? <laughs> Let me just say, like, thank you so much to the Walking Dead family because, I mean, they've been the biggest supporters of Scorn. Like, they've been asking me about Scorn for literally years. So wow. I've been talking about literally years. And so it was, it was really important for me to finish this project and be able to bring it to them. Yeah. And they've just been like so incredible. So thank you so much for supporting it, for sharing it in your Instagram stories and tweeting about it and all of the things It like, I mean, my heart is so full and yeah, thanks to you guys for having me on the show. It was our pleasure. Thank you. You're a great guest. So oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right so i guess that's it so um thank you so much take care of yourselves okay yeah we will, These are we will. crazy times yes it is all right all right and we'll you, talk soon okay great all right, all right. Bye, bye 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 okay so um if uh th this is where we usually end things so how do people get a hold of us? Well, we always want to encourage our listeners to follow us on Twitter. And you can find us at Walking Dead GSM. And to submit your theories and feedback, most people post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Walking Dead GSM. You could also email us at walkingdead at talkthroughmedia.com. And there's a feedback form on TalkThroughMedia.com, and that's TalkThroughMedia.com slash feedback. Or you could call us at 216-232-6146. 216-232-6146. Act now. Now, what, one thing I'm going to say is probably at some point very soon, probably after we re-release this, we're going to change our Twitter handle and our Facebook to from Walking Dead GSM to what it should be now, which is Walking Dead TTM. But I know if you go to the Facebook group and you say GSM, it will refer you back to Walking Dead TTM once we set that up. But um, yeah, it's about time we did that. <laughs> so it's getting close to a year since it's we... It's almost a year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and we're going to do something special with this episode. Um, we are going to release the video of this episode on YouTube. And we might put it on our Facebook group as well. Um, I'll have to see if I can, if I can swing that or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you may see that at the on the facebook page would which would be uh facebook.com forward slash talk through media and it'll be there on our uh, network page and it'll also be available on the uh in the facebook group um speaking of that uh like and review the uh talk through media page which is at facebook.com forward slash talk through media and the best way you can support us is through our Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash walking dead talk through. And we would like to thank our Patreon supporters, Steve Brown, Alex Baelish, and Lawrence Todd. And you can subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or the podcast client of choice. And while you're there, give us a rating review. Um, we're also... A, you can rate us and review us at Podchaser, and you can that's at podchaser.com and you can actually rate and review the individual episodes there and remember to share our posts on twitter and facebook when we post them 
and especially tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to get uh, new latest listeners. So, you know, we didn't even mention it, but Kyle, um, Kyle was unavailable tonight. So uh, <laughs> I just realized that it's like people are probably wondering where is Kyle? Kyle was Kyle. unavailable. So, and I'm not podcasting on Star Trek these days, so I'm back on The Walking Dead. But uh, and speaking of that, um, we are still releasing episodes on uh, the Star Trek Picard cast. We just released uh, an episode on uh, Saturday, which was an interview with Una McCormack, who is the author of uh, Star Trek Picard, The Last Best Hope. And our Patreon for that is going to be doing a, a call-in show on Saturday, the 16th of May. And we will be covering, actually talking about that, um, that book. And then on May 23rd, we're going to be doing a round table finally on season one. So it's like we've had like a, now a couple of months uh, since Picard ended, but uh, we're going to finally do our round table. Uh, and um, that's it for, for me. Uh, we will be, of course, doing the Star Trek Discovery podcast when Discovery comes back. Uh, Mark, I know you've got two projects that you can talk about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, for the most part, you can find me on Panels to Pixels. We're still putting out episodes per week, and obviously I am working on an edit tonight before we finish. Uh, yeah, the we're continuing on with our Twitcher reviews, and after that we will continue on probably with a short project. We're trying to get uh, a guest celebrity guests as well on that you could also hear me on let's talk through kyle and i are working on a new possible episode so that way you'll have something because right now with a talk through media.com network we only have a few episodes right now so we yeah. want to fill that so you have something to listen to and be entertained within this whole quarantine and this whole new reality that we have with masks yeah and i will probably be joining uh for the next let's talk through i i will be a guest on that uh once we figure out what we're going to talk about but uh, we have so many options and yeah a variety of different things yeah so if you guys have a topic that you would like us to talk about on let's talk through always send a comment on our talk through media Facebook page or on the let's talk through Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So that way we'll take whatever recommendations you have that you want to listen up to hear us talk about. Yeah. And also panels pixels. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, we always take recommendations. <laughs> yeah. So our next episode at least as far as The Walking Dead, is season 10, episode 16, the season finale, which is displaced. And we should have already seen it already, but coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's they titled... have another two weeks of uh, po post-production, so. Yeah. It's titled A Certain Doom. The story is by Jim Barnes, Eli Jornay, I believe it's Jornay, and Corey Reed. And the teleplay is by Corey Reed. And it's directed by Greg Nicotero, uh, and we don't have the uh, description for it. But uh, mm. that's it for now. It was great having Lindsley Register on tonight. It's our first interview in a long time. We, we had one way, way back when Ruthie was uh, on the show. Um, she interviewed uh, Vincent M. Ward. Um, so this is like... <laughs> First one we've done in like four years, but it was, it was great to have her on. And again, uh, her her movie is called Scorn, and it's available on Amazon Video, as she said, in the U.S. and the U.K. And you can rent it, I believe, for a dollar ninety nine, and you can purchase it for four ninety nine. So yeah. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. So I just went ahead and bought it. Same here. Yeah. So. Until next time, I'm Brian. And I'm Mark. And this is The Walking Dead Talk Through. 
Good night, everybody. Good night.